Thank you. Welcome. Come on in. There's a lot more room down on the far end of, of uh, this big, wide space. Uh, so come, spread out, make yourself at home. Uh, we're just thrilled to be here. I'm Michael. This is my colleague, Austin. Uh, we work on the operator framework and now and in the past in various capacities. We're here to share some lessons that we've learned with you about operator design. Uh, we're going to tag team here a little bit. Uh, I'm going to dive in, and I think Austin's going to be back in a few minutes. So let's get right to it. Getting started with operators and operator development is pretty easy these days. We've got the operator SDK. Uh, there's uh, other tooling out there. There's Cube Builder. A variety of languages are supported now that you can use for developing some kind of operator. Uh, and you can get something up and going pretty quick that does installation, uninstallation, maybe a little bit of reconfiguration, uh, and be pretty satisfied with that. But we want you to have more advanced, more useful operators that you can really do things with, uh, that really make day two operations successful. And day two, as we've learned, is full of messy challenges. These are just you know, the first 20 or so that came to mind uh, that you can face when you're orchestrating operational concerns with your operator, really solving operational problems, the kind of things SRE teams worry about. So we have a lot of experience managing stateful infrastructure. And uh, <laughs> that comes with a lot of those day two challenges. Um, you know, things like uh, you know, bare metal server provisioning and these kinds of things. Uh, we've helped make operators for cluster installation, cluster upgrade, uh, a lot of infrastructure related stuff that can take time. Uh, it can be error prone, it can be very configuration sensitive. Uh, when you have a cloud API, of course, you know what you're gonna get in advance, for example, when you're deploying a cluster. When you're doing that in a data center, there's a lot more opportunity for, for variation of environment, right? So we've, we've done a lot of that and uh, made a lot of these kind of operators in that space. And yes, we've even made an operator for installing more operators. If only it was so easy as, as this. Uh, this is my FOGO. I hope you'll be OK with some of that along the way. Uh, if we could reconcile and just say, what's the current state? What's the desired state? Do a little bit of work to move the one a little closer to the other, and then set some status, and whoop, we're out of there. Success. That would be nice, right? And that is largely what we want to do in our operators, but the implementation of that can get a little more complex. So let's start. We've got five sections for you, and this is number one. We're going to start with some API anti-patterns, lessons we've learned about API design. Here's a pod set API. Shout out to anybody who implemented a pod set operator yesterday in our workshop. But here I've added an annotation uh, <laughs> called enable hot new feature. True. I've seen this in the wild. Uh, I've, I've done my best to talk some people out of this on occasion. It's very tempting to do this, this kind of thing where you take a bit of information that really ought to be in the spec of a resource, but you put it in, in an annotation as more or less what I like to call a no consequences API. Why would you do this? Uh, well, sometimes you need a temporary behavior. Uh, it's a workaround for something. It's not going to be here for long. Let's just put it in an annotation. Uh, you know, we know what the reality is of a lot of temporary solutions. Uh, sometimes there's a deadline pressure. Uh, we've got to get this out quick. We need to enable this new thing. Maybe it's a feature gate, whatever it is. Um, don't really have time to go through a full API review right now, or dealing with a CRD upgrade is not really in the cards right now. Let's just put an annotation on this resource. We can get the feature out there, and, uh, and we'll, we'll deal with the rest of it later. Uh, or sometimes a hidden feature. Um, you can actually use this as, as something of a feature gate. You don't want to advertise it in your, in your resource, but you still want it to be available. So what's, what's the problem? What's the downside of this? Well, you don't get API versioning. You're not plugged into the versioning scheme of your CRD anymore. Uh, there's no status to reflect feedback to the API user of whatever this is, unless, of course, you put another annotation on your resource to <laughs> give a little status. I have seen that. Uh, don't recommend that. There's no validation. Uh, you know, we have access to like amazing validation now right out of the box, enforced by the Kubernetes API server. Uh, it's real easy to use, but when you're using an annotation, of course, we don't have access to that kind of validation quite so easily. 
Uh, it's harder to document this. Annotations are not somewhere that people normally look when they're trying to figure out how can they accomplish a behavior with your API. And then, of course, for a user who's actually using that API, let's say you're on a cluster kubectl get pod set, you're not necessarily going to look at the annotation list for things that are going to influence the behavior of that API. Um, so it's just easy to not notice. So what should you do instead? Obviously, you've got to make your own judgment calls about when the deadline is, is really so tight that you just got to, got to swallow hard and deal with it. But you're really going to be happier in the long run that you added a field to your spec, that you just took the time to get it right, go through whatever you need to do, and just put it there and document it. Um, feature gates for pre-release features can sometimes be a nice thing. Uh, we've you know, done quite a bit of that in the OpenShift world. Um, a mix of documentation on the field itself combined with a, a feature flag that's usually a configuration property of the operator itself. Not the API the operator implements, but the operator itself. That's a, a better place to put that kind of a feature gate that can then make a field either be useful or not. So that, that's a good way to handle that. Um, great. Now here's another anti-pattern. Uh, outgrowing Booleans. This one uh, borrowed the description right from the Kubernetes API conventions, which is a fantastic document. If you have anything to do with designing Kubernetes APIs, uh, either as part of Kubernetes or for your own uses and operators, highly recommend set aside some time, maybe for taking a flight home from this event, read through this uh, API conventions document. It has a lot of insight and, uh, and guidelines that are, you know, written in the ink of people who have seen the problems. They've been there, they've lived through the pain, and they're sharing them here. And this is a favorite, outgrowing a Boolean. Uh, so here's, let's imagine we, we have a, a new DNS provider, new DNS service called Fancy DNS. And we're running it in a cluster, so we made an operator for it. Uh, it's, it's very simple. Now you may know that DNS queries tend to uh, happen over UDP, but also can happen over TCP. So some product manager comes along and says, you know what, we've got some customers, they want to just disable TCP. Can we just add that feature, just turn that off? Sure, sounds sensible. So we add a field called enable TCP, and we can set it to false, and now that's disabled, easy, done. Well, a quarter goes by and, and PM comes back and says, you know, we've got a growing number of customers, they've got some oddball use case, they actually don't want to use UDP at all, they want to do just TCP for, for their DNS queries. Kind of weird, but you know, it happens. Can we make that also configurable? Can we be able to turn off UDP, but keep TCP? Okay, we had another field. Uh, let's be able to enable UDP optionally. So now we've got a growing list of Booleans, and we've got a circumstance where one point in our four square matrix is not really valid. We don't want both of these to be false, right? So now we've got a validation concern that's gotten more complicated. Everybody's life is getting more complicated all of a sudden. What should we have done? Something more like this. Reframe the question. Reframe the, the API itself. Think about it differently, not as a Boolean on or off, but uh, what listen protocol do you want? Is it UDP? Is it TCP? Is it both? Maybe instead of both, I should have said all, in case the third protocol shows up someday. Um, but uh, in any case, that I find is the secret to having a better API field than using a Boolean as the type. Reframe how you're thinking about that kind of setting. Um, look at it through a different lens in that way. And then one more. Kubernetes API is a data store. Uh, it's just not a great data store. Now, these are rough numbers, more like an order of magnitude. But etcd is designed for a pretty small number of pretty small values. Um, you know. We've seen things like device inventories being tracked. I've done this, device inventories of various kinds being tracked. We, we do Kubernetes native infrastructure. So we're very deep in the OpenShift world, at least philosophically, into managing infrastructure using Kubernetes native APIs. So we run up against these scale concerns periodically. And when you think about something, a problem space like a device inventory, a good metric would be like hundreds of devices that are related to, to this cluster, like the nodes in that cluster and the machines that are part of the cluster API, these kinds of things. Bad would be like millions of edge devices. You probably should not be trying to track that uh, as CRDs in your Kubernetes cluster. 
Um, another potential gotcha is config maps and secrets for arbitrary input. Very tempting to say, okay, we need to allow somebody to provide a little bit of their own YAML manifest as part of installing this other thing. Uh, let's just let them uh, provide that as a config map. It makes a nice, easy story, and it'll work for a while until it doesn't, because there's a size limit to how much data you can stuff into a config map, um, and, uh, and the secret is the same. And uh, TLS certificates can be another one uh, that occasionally in some edge cases can get you. It's easy to think, oh, certificates aren't that large. Well, until they are, you know, you get somebody with a long chain of trust trying to put the whole chain into one secret, and things can get rough. So don't use the Kubernetes API as a data store is a best practice. What should you, what should you do instead? Use a different data store. Find a database. Um, I love Kubernetes native APIs as much as about anybody you'll find. Uh, it's great when it's the right tool for the job, but when it's not the right tool for the job, go find another tool, and that's, uh, we'll all be happier for it. Um, KCP is a, an up-and-coming, emerging uh, project that I think has a lot of promise for this kind of scale, for managing with a Kubernetes native API a very large scale of, uh, of data and resources. That is the kind of project you might be interested in using someday uh, for something like millions of edge devices. But stay tuned, highly recommend. I, I know there's probably a lot of KCP talks this week. That's a very cool project. Check that, out, that, uh, that stuff out. Uh, if you really need to use config maps to take in arbitrary data, use an array. It's not beautiful, um, but it works. OK. Number two, slow and imperative Kubernetes native APIs. What are examples of this? So cluster installation and upgrade. This is the kind of uh, thing that could take 20 minutes, could take an hour, might take a couple hours. Um, upgrade, depending on what kind of constraints you have, how big is your cluster, how long does it take to drain a node, uh, then upgrade that node in place, for example, uh, if that's the upgrade pattern you follow, and, uh, and get workloads back on, and then go on to the next node. You know, we've heard stories of people uh, take days, a week or more, depending on their various constraints to get through a cluster upgrade, especially with very, very large clusters. Um, so these kind of things, especially if you put a Kubernetes native API in front of this, it's long, it's imperative, errors could happen a long time after somebody declares what their desired state. Um, provisioning bare metal, likewise. It might take 10 or 15 minutes for a server that you're trying to provision with a Kubernetes native API just to boot. Uh, and then you write some stuff to disk, and then you reboot it. Okay, now it's another 10 or 15 minutes to see what happened. Um, backing up data, of course, backups take a long time. So these are the kind of infrastructure concerns that are slow, they're pretty imperative, and uh, are ripe for some kind of something to not go according to plan. But your goal as an operator author is really to take an imperative world and make it exposed and available through a declarative API. So my, my best advice to you on this is embrace using imperative patterns in your operator. It's easy for us to get trapped into a mindset, you know, a, a declarative API mindset, and feel oh, we have to be declarative, um, the whole edge and level-based conundrum. But when you're writing your operator code, just remember your job is to be that bridge. Be as imperative as you need to be in your operator code, but expose that through a really nice declarative API. Uh, so thing, tips that you can use along the way when you're doing this. Implement a state machine when you need one. Go for it. On the right here, uh, this is from the Metal Cubed project. This is, don't squint too hard, I didn't really mean for you to, <laughs> to actually be reading this. This is just like for, you know, for effect. Um, this is the actual state machine used by that project. Uh, this is a project that interacts with BMCs, baseboard management controllers, on real server hardware to control it from Kubernetes APIs, turn, so, you know, turn hardware on and off, provision it, uh, these kinds of, of things. And they absolutely, they wrote it, they have an operator, it's the bare metal operator, and they use a state machine and it works well. Uh, many resources can have an end state. You know, a job is a good example. That's one that many of us are familiar with, it's built in. It starts, it does some work, it ends, it has a finite state. You can embrace that and you can create your own resource in that same kind of pattern that is designed to have a final state, and that's okay. Um, returning from your reconcile function promptly, this is a best practice in general, but try not to like start your reconcile function, kick off an install, wait, 
wait, wait, wait, wait, an hour later it finishes and then you return from your reconcile. Of course you don't want to do that. You're going to want to monitor some other way. Return from your reconcile function in your controller. We'll talk in a minute about some other ways to monitor that, but you'll be happier in the long run the faster you can return from that reconcile. Uh, and then uh, just avoid implementing long workflows in, in your operator in general. Um, you want the, as much as you can, the implementation of those things to be somewhere else, like a BMC that's rebooting a server. That, that behavior is implemented in the BMC. You're controlling it, you're telling it, reboot. And then you wait and you can pull or, you know, through some mechanism, observe what that BMC is doing. But you don't really want to implement a long, like, have, like, install, OpenShift install logic, for example, like, in your reconcile function. That would be a bad plan. Um, so what can you do? You could spawn a job and actually use a job to implement some of that logic. Or a cron job would be very similar. And that your controller can create those jobs and just watch them uh, until they, com they complete. It's a very nice experience because it's a Kubernetes API itself. It, ha it generates events. You can watch those events, reconcile whenever that job emits an event, and, uh, and therefore be immediately plugged in when, uh, when that operation that you're interested in finishes. Another option, you could use some kind of serverless or function as a service or maybe some config management, um, like Ansible AWX is an example of that. Some external system uh, that's not part of your operator that can is designed for these start to end workflows that you can, uh, that you can trigger, wait on, observe the state of, and, uh, and let them complete. But uh, this is an important point. Don't access the Kubernetes API from those external processes if you can avoid it because I think as Austin's going to talk about in just a minute, using a caching client is hugely valuable. Um, we want to avoid querying the Kubernetes API as much as we can um, without some kind of caching layer in between. Controller runtime, uh, cube builder, operator SDK, all these use a caching client that, that we want to use as much as possible. And then you can use a channel source. So if you're familiar with controller runtime at all, hopefully many of you are, if you've ever done any Go-based operator development in particular, you can use a, a channel source. And basically what happens here is you can stick in this event structure into a Go channel anytime you see fit, and that will now kick off a reconcile in your operator of a particular resource. Uh, so you can either, maybe you're using a Go routine to pull some external system, and whenever you get, that system gets to a certain state, now you stick uh, that event into this Go channel. Um, or maybe you're, you've got an HTTP callback that you're listening for, and that sticks that event in that channel. But this is a, a best practice and a really nice pattern for bridging that gap. And I'm going to hand it off to Austin for our third topic. Okay, so we've talked about good patterns for developing your operator so that you don't get into trouble. But now let's talk about how to be a good citizen on the cluster. We've got to minimize the API load because all those operators have to live there together. So step one, you've got to collect metrics. And it's a good idea to start collecting metrics early in the development cycle. It's so easy to say, oh, we'll get it fully functioning and then we'll start measuring it. But it's much better to know how your performance is being impacted as you're adding features. Um, controller runtime, which is underneath uh, the operator SDK, will expose Prometheus metrics to you uh, out of the box. So if you have Prometheus installed on your cluster, there's no reason not to be consuming those metrics. Uh, you, can you can create some custom metrics uh, completely on your own. Uh, to measure whatever you'd like. It's very easy, I've done it myself. As your, uh, as your operator is running on the cluster, keep an eye on how it's changing. Don't just deploy it and then assume that it's going to work forever because operators are dependent on the cluster state and the performance can change as those clusters change. And pay special attention to endpoint disruption, and if it starts to get past a couple seconds, you know that you need to do something. So how can an operator be a bad citizen? Well, the first thing is a watch. Watches are much more expensive than you might realize. And when you have lots of operators on there, this can uh, scale up very badly. 
So just remember, watches are expensive. Um, Cube API server, uh, it can limit the number of watches allowed simultaneously on the cluster. I know that OpenShift does this. Um, and uh, even if that limit isn't reached, those resource uh, utilization can continue to scale uh, in a way that is not desirable. Um, so how do you avoid this? Well, if you've got some very tightly coupled operators, maybe they don't need to be two operators. If you've got two control loops that are watching the same objects, consider putting them into the same operator so that they can share a cache. That cache will emit a watch to the API server, and any of the extra performance is going to be between your operator and that cache. Second, we want to avoid the uh, low sync periods. So if you're not familiar, a sync period is the maximum amount of time that your operator will go without syncing again. Uh, most of the time, we think of an operator as reconciling based on events, and that's the way it should be. You don't want your operator running every five minutes because it is expensive. It defaults to 10 hours for a reason. <laughs> Um, and it's tempting to do because, whoa, what if it misses an event? It doesn't miss events. It's very unlikely. And even if it does, the next event, it'll get caught up. Um, if you do have some bugs, a low sync period can cover them up. And wouldn't it be better to just know that you've got a bug? And if absolutely necessary, if you need to be uh, triggering reconciles more frequently than events are coming in, Consider using requeue after. Uh, this is something that happens as your operator is exiting. You can say, hey, I'm not sure about the state. Can you requeue like right now? Or wait 10 minutes, try again. So we know that we can make our reconciliations cost less. But how can we do fewer reconciliations? Well. You do not need to reconcile every single time any event from anything that you're watching comes on in. You can uh, filter those events with predicates. Uh, controller Runtime provides a handful of very good predicates just right out of the box that you can use, just like I've done here uh, with the with event filter. It's also very simple to create your own custom uh, predicates here. Um, and this will stop you from reconciling when it's not necessary. So inside of your reconcile loop, when you're hitting the Kubernetes API, know when you can get away with a patch. A patch uses many fewer resources than an apply, and it's gonna go faster. But be very careful, because if there are multiple actors changing these resources, an apply is safer, particularly a server-side apply which is the new way. All of us need to know about that. Uh, so if you're going to start playing with this, please be sure to check out uh, server-side apply as well as the various merge strategies. So at the end of your reconcile, when you go to update the status, this is a, a, just a nice, easy way to stop using so many resources. If the status hasn't changed, don't update it. It's as simple as that. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the client cache, which is designed to make performance much better, but sometimes it can backfire. So let's talk about a specific case. This is a classic thing. We have people coming into the chat all the time saying, oh, I've got this operator. It's become totally unwieldy. What happened? Well, here's how you end up in this scenario. Let's say that you've got an operator that is watching a secret. Uh, let's say that it has a database password or something. So of course, if that secret changes, if the database password changes, you are going to have to restart some things. So you do need to watch for that secret. But out of the box, and this may not be noticed on a small development cluster, that cache is now watching all secrets. And so if you now take that operator and put it on a large cluster with 10,000 secrets, every single time that any of those 
secrets change, you're uh, you are consuming those events, and it is expensive. So how do we avoid this? Uh, using the uh, controller runtime, we can now add selectors by object when we are establishing the cache. And what this does is it filters out those events from ever making it into the cache. Now, this, I've got it big and red here so that you will not accidentally do this. It's a big gotcha. Those events don't exist to your operator. So in this case, we're only watching uh, my secret, not yours. So your operator cannot see those other secrets, which you might even consider it a feature. And back to Michael for multi-cluster and the future. Well, this is one of the more interesting areas, I think, of operator design right now. And we see the world changing to be far more multi-cluster than it's been in the past. More clusters that are smaller, clusters that have more tightly scoped purposes. You know, this, this cluster does this, some other cluster does that, as opposed to having one big, broad cluster that does it all. Clusters that come and go, clusters of service, these are all things that, that are growing uh, in popularity uh, quite rapidly. But the pace of being able to access, like have good tooling to access many clusters from one operator um, is catching up. And, and there's, there's work to be done. So this topic is as much sharing with you what the state of the world is and what you can do now as it is a, an invitation to help, uh, an invitation to get involved, uh, it, even if it's just sharing use cases uh, or come help build the next generation of multi-cluster client, uh, certainly in controller runtime at least. So here's some use cases. Um, we do, again, Kubernetes native infrastructure management. So we do, it, it, with an OpenShift, policy and governance through Kubernetes APIs. You've got a hub cluster, you get a many, many spoke clusters, and you can enforce policies about resources and, and different things that exist on those spoke clusters, right? Well, that, re that requires you to interact with those clusters. Um, another use case is just having a central source of truth a related topic, and propagating that out to clusters as those clusters come and go. Maybe you've got in a, a, some secure, like robust data center type facility, a larger management cluster, and then you've got a bunch of edge clusters that are subject to change. Maybe they're subject to, to disasters or fire or uh, theft or who knows what, or just failure, and you're just going to replace them. So propagating out central sources of truth. Um, KCP, in fact, is again coming up and, uh, and we're very relevant in that domain. Uh, management, um, scaling, upgrading, uh, remote clusters, that's, a, that's definitely a use case. And uh, having some kind of central controller, one controller that itself is not just interacting and managing resources on the cluster that it's running on, but maybe it's one controller managing resources and, and operands across many clusters. Let's say you have 10, 12 clusters running all in the same facility. Do you need to run the pod set operator just to pick on our own fictional experimental operator? Do you need to run the pod set operator on every single cluster? Or could you just run it on one of them and have that one process be watching and interacting with all of, with all of those clusters? That would be nice, right? Um, that's not quite possible yet. So here's what we do have. Uh, this is in controller runtime. It probably could use some better or more prominent documentation if anybody's up for that. Um, but basically what we're looking at here is this new resource, uh, this new type called cluster. Um, so what you can do here, what I'm showing here is imagining you're going to watch config maps in some other external cluster and then be able to retrieve the config maps from that external cluster when necessary. So in this first function, we get a cube config. Uh, we set up this cluster resource with that cube config. Uh, and then in that cluster resource, we can get a client. Uh, and that client now, of course, can be used to access those things. But here's an important aspect. There's nothing yet in controller runtime that really helps us 
keep track of that reference, keep track of either that client or keep track of that cluster resource. So you gotta keep, just store that somewhere yourself. So here where I've got that first red arrow, uh, I just picked an arbitrary key called name. You know, maybe it's a cluster name, might be, might be something different that's meaningful to you in your circumstance. But the point is you're gonna create that cluster resource and then store it somewhere where you can retrieve it later. And now you can implement a watch. Uh, so that exists, you can do a watch just like uh, it shows here. You inject the cache, as you can see there on the line nine, if you all can read that, I don't know if you can, but you can inject the correct cache. Uh, and then you're probably gonna need a custom handler that understands how to map that event from a different cluster, from a, a secondary resource, a config map on some other cluster, to the primary resource of your actual operator, uh, whatever that might be. And then in the second function here, uh, now it's time to access that config map. We wanna read it off that external cluster. Uh, you're gonna have to retrieve that client, and so here again, you're inventing your own mechanism for getting access to that client, the right client at the right time. Uh, so it's workable, uh, and it's a step in the right direction, but it, clearly it's not quite a, a complete story for all the use cases that we see in front of us. Um, so things you might consider for your multi-cluster access, there are different patterns based on different needs. Uh, do you really need to watch events? Do you need to do this list watch pattern or not? Maybe you're just very occasionally doing a request uh, to some external cluster, in which case, don't worry so much about a caching client, all this stuff. You can just stand up a client on demand and just do it. Maybe that's just okay for your circumstance. Um, how many clusters do you really need to interact with? Is it just a handful? Is it a thousand? Is it a million edge devices running some small cluster? Um, that can really impact uh, the style and, and the way that you're gonna keep a cache, the way you're gonna keep a client and where that's gonna happen, how you might shard that out. Uh, and then will you be adding and subtracting clusters dynamically? So for example, uh, with this cluster resource in controller runtime, the, the classic example that, that is shown there is you're mirroring uh, a resource from like cluster A to cluster B. You know about these in advance and that's the job. You're, you're doing this, this mirroring back and forth. But in these other multi-cluster management kind of scenarios, you start your operator and then after it's running, you're telling it dynamically, okay, there's a new cluster that I'm introducing. Uh, I need you to start managing. This cluster is, has gone away now. It's been deprovisioned. Um, so as these come and go, that, that adds a significant layer of complexity. Right now, at least today, watches are a lot easier to add than they are to remove. Um, so that, that's a significant consideration. Now, where is this going? KCP is doing some excellent client work. If you're interested in this, uh, we have at least one, I thought we had two, maybe she's still around, uh, of the people who are actually doing this work uh, are up here in the second row. You come talk to them. But there's a world developing in a fork of controller runtime by the KCP project uh, to, to move this forward where your reconcile function will get a request that includes now not just a name and a namespace, but a cluster identifier as part of that key. Uh, and then you can create your, a context that has that cluster attached to it. And now as long as you use that context with future client requests, it, your client will use the correct cluster, the correct cache, um, and uh, give you that sort of seamless client experience we've come to, to really love and, and uh, take advantage of in controller runtime. So that's, I think, where things are going, but it's clearly still in development. And if this is something that matters to you, um, get involved with probably the KCP community is a good place to go. The, uh, what's the channel in the Kubernetes? Well, I think it's on our last slide. Well, let's go to the last slide. Um, no, it's not on our, on our last slide. KCP dev in the Kubernetes Slack, and then what's the operator one? Kubernetes, Kubernetes operators in the Kubernetes Slack. Both of those places are good places to ask about this. All right, that's the end of our content. I think we have like a minute or two for questions. Uh, it, especially if you like this, uh, give us a review at this QR code. Uh, you can contact us, Twitter, uh, email, or come up, talk, and then we'll be at the Operator Framework booth at least between when we leave here and let's say four o'clock, if you wanna chat some more about that or just chase us down later. So uh, with that, any, any questions? We have time for one question. No pressure. Um, you talked about performance issues and ways to avoid them, and I'm curious what resources you would point people to who are, did not 
have not used the, the, the tools that you've provided and need to go diagnose their own terrible mistakes. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> okay, so the question is, so the question is, uh, my operator has not been a good citizen and is consuming lots of resources. What do I do? Well, it depends on uh, what, it, what is going wrong. If you're using a bunch of watches, there's uh, some nice ways to uh, trim that back. And if not, I would recommend you come by Kubernetes operators in uh, Kubernetes Slack, and you'll find that uh, the operator folks are very helpful and uh, just nice people. Great. All right. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Let's give uh, Michael and Austin a last round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.